Welcome everyone to our talk. Um, it's going to be about uh, Delta updates, um, so how to make base system updates leaner um, for yeah, infield updates. Um, so this is happening in the context of the Civil Infrastructure Platform Project. It's a real good example for, for broad uh, collaboration in the project and beyond. Um, but first of all, uh, I'd like to introduce you to us. Um, who are we? So uh, maybe, Felix, a few words about yourself. Yeah, I'm Felix Mesbauer. I work at Siemens Technology um, as an embedded Linux consultant and developer. And I also, I'm, I'm lucky because I, I'm allowed to contribute for, uh, to major open source projects, not just for fun, but also for profit. And apart from that, um, I develop a lot of in-house tooling we, we use at Siemens. Yeah, and uh, basically, I'm Jan Piesker, I'm doing basically the same, um, just a little bit longer, I think, by now. Um, I'm also part of the CIP project, um, leading there the, um, the CIP kernel group, or being the, the chair, so to say, the work is done by other people. I'm also maintaining inside this uh, CIP project uh, the CIP core layer, what it is, we'll find a few words later on. Uh, but also beyond, I'm maintainer and, and, and contributor to various open source projects. I guess maybe you have seen some talk of me before here in that context. So our use case for, for today is about robust in-field updates. So who of you are operating devices in the field that needs over-the-air updates? Okay, <laughs> yes, I guess we're on the right talk. So there are many of these examples by now. And we just picked one here um, from the fancy uh, domain of, of car charging, e-car charging. Um, so you have these charging stations all across the board um, for various uh, purposes, um, uh, in-house or, or, or public uh, charging stations. And they, they are quite complex systems by now. Né? They have uh, software for the actual control of the charging, but they also have a UI. Né? If, you, if you're charging uh, the, the folks who want to get the energy there, um, you may have an interaction with the users. Um, uh, you have not only just one controller, there are possibly many, and they have software. Um, they have to be updated, obviously, um, over the air. They might be remotely placed and not connected to some uh, wired network. Um, and, and as I said, the systems are complex, so what, what we are shipping to these devices are, are not just megabytes anymore, it can easily be gigabytes, if you do the complete refresh of the system there with all the controllers inside. Um, you want to do that uh, normally in a consistent state, so you're not shipping the bits and bytes individually, but you're rather shipping a consistent state. It has been tested upfront because the worst thing that can happen that one of these uh, stations go offline because of a wrong update and someone has to go there and press the reset button or even worse, come with a service stick and reinstall the device there. So this is a critical use case. Still, as they are remotely and they might be connected uh, via a wireless network, um, it can be, well, there can be limited bandwidths or there can be even limited and charged bandwidths. So this can be cost factor to reduce how much you actually uh, transfer over the line. Um, so this is, this is roughly the problem space um, that you can find also in other domains. And now the question is how to make that case um, easily adoptable. We are implementing a lot of these devices in our company. The CIP project have many users who are implementing that. And the key problem for us was, or the key uh, question for us was how to make this adoption of the pattern easier for everyone. So the CIP project, just to introduce it briefly, uh, in a nutshell, from a top level view, we are uh, about, our mission is to provide an industrial grade Linux. Um, that means we are not inventing the wheel from the beginning. We are basically building on top of many, many existing open source projects. Um, we are rather looking for the gaps uh, in the domain of industrial um, and, and critical infrastructure, adoption of such kind of complex systems, and then jump in when no one else is looking after that and, and, and fill the gaps by contributing or if there's really no one like this or no project like this existing already, also creating new projects and then operating them. Um, we provide also, and that will be also about the talk, pre-integration patterns. So none of these systems you can just install and run just by adding uh, your own file on top. It's more like customization and, and tailoring. If you have different hardware, you have different applications running, you have a different combination of things. Um, so what we can provide are the pre-integration patterns so that you can benefit from that and do 
the 90% yourself, uh, the 90% uh, from the pattern, and the 10% only yourself. That's the idea behind it. Um, and then obviously comes the, the longevity of these uh, integrations. Um, these devices, they don't live like your mobile, and even the mobile devices by now have a longer lifetime. So these have to be maintained in the field. Updates have to be provided, whatever strategy there is. Um, so when there is a gap in the maintenance of these components, we also look into um, ensuring the longevity of them by working again with the communities or by doing it ourselves. So one of the examples is that we have a super long living uh, kernel for this uh, purpose domain um, in our portfolio. And last but not least, this is uh, more important uh, these days, we're also working on the uh, security certification of such an integration, the pre-certification. And what you're certifying there is a product, uh, the whole integration, but we try to uh, provide as many reasonable, reusable building blocks for the certification process. Now, specifically for the problem domain I mentioned before, um, there are two work groups in CIP uh, which have direct impact on that. There's a CIP core work group and the software update work group. So what are they providing or working on? So from the CIP core, uh, we have a pre-integration layer um, where we pull together relevant components um, for software update pattern for uh, secure booting. Here we are using um, the supply chain of, of Debian heavily. Um, so basically this integration is uh, providing a, an image build environment um, and a customization environment for, for Debian packages or uh, an ad hoc build environment for Debian packages if there are none in the upstream communities. Um, the integration pattern that can be described this way then addresses the key elements of, of securely booting such systems and, well, obviously, remotely updating them. So that is then also described in this layer um, as a reference. So we are using here Debian. We are, in some cases, have to adopt to how Debian is doing things, but the whole concept here is obviously also transferable to other environments. So it's a lot of similarity with how Yocto are building things. Uh, conceptually, it's not a one-to-one -one copying over, but if you understand the concepts here, you can transfer them also if you're working on a Yocto open embedded environment. So what are the key building blocks for us in the software update work group? Well, again, there are many, many, many options on the market. Uh, we choose one, um, the SW update um, tool, which is a service running on the device to um, manage the update to orchestrate it there. Um, that's one element. There are others, uh, RAUG, for example, but this is how we, we started a while ago and, and how we customized. Um, and then there's a, a backend service, an orchestration service um, to manage the, the fleet of devices, so to say, or a fleet of updates. Uh, it's a WFX framework, which is, well, a core, execution core for orchestrating, as I said, the, the updates things. This is where we are uh, working on and integrating. Um, again, we are collaborating here. SW Update is not a CIP project. It's a third party um, development. We are contributing there. We are integrating and helping to make it more usable. WFX, by chance, happens to be right now a Siemens project. Uh, we are working on, on transferring this um, as well. So that's the, the building blocks, the key building blocks on the technical side. Um, the approach we are, we are taking here for have a reliable update is also very conservative. It's a classical dual copy update pattern that we are applying here. That means you have uh, always a running version of your software stack, and then you are uh, preparing a new version that you try out, and then you can fall back always to the, to the existing version if the, the tryout fails in, in the field. So for that, we are enabling, or we have enabled SW update with a corresponding uh, handler to manage the switchover. Um, we have uh, brought forward a an, an project um, for uh, doing this control during the boot time, if you boot guard, um, so that you can select the path there. Um, that's, um, yeah, the straight way forward to, to do the control there. Um, and the pattern we are using here is, is an immutable rootFS, um, and on top, an overlay to manage, well, the customization, the specification of a device when, um, yeah, a private or a device individual data has to be stored. All that also can, or well, has to be done, obviously, these days securely. So secure boot um, has to be applicable here. So we are following, wherever possible, um, the um, 
The AFI pass for that, so System Ready, you may have heard about it, is providing that not only for x86, but also way beyond. Um, so we are building on top of that for, for secure booting. Um, we are also uh, have pre-integrated, which is again an existing feature of SW Update, but you have to be aware of that, um, the signing of the update artifacts so that you're not executing a random, p a random stuff being downloaded to the device. You actually can validate that this is coming from the uh, trusted source before then um, applying it. Um, we have pre-integrated this encryption, which is, well, also no rocket science, but it has to be done so that everything which is modifiable on the device is uh, stored in an encrypted partition. And last but not least, we are also validating uh, the immutable part, the root of S, in this case with DM Verity, also pre-integrated. All in all, no rocket science. Maybe you are using part of these already or something similar, but in the end, you have to pull them all together. And if you have to pull many things together, there can always be a mistake or some, some forgotten element. And if you forget something in this critical thing, well, the device is either insecure or not reliable or both of them. So this is the key element about that. So a few words on the, on the update uh, schema. I mentioned it already. Um, we are using here the, the classic AB schema. So you always have uh, up to two full um, images from your um, updatable elements. Um, so that means uh, you have uh, two kernels uh, that you want to boot um, and two root FSs. Um, so the kernel, we, we use the unified kernel image format for that in order to have a container uh, which contains the kernel, an init ROM FS if you need one, uh, command line settings if you have something, or even a device tree override for what uh, the firmware is not providing uh, properly for the device. That thing comes into one container that can be signed. So you have that element is the first thing coming after the bootloader. And then you have the, the root FS um, containing everything that you need to operate the core system in order to well, also operate um, the updates, obviously. And that is in an in a immutable squash FS. Um, that can become obviously quite large unless you then start to split out and move certain things into um, yeah, additional partitions which can be separately updated. But yeah, normally you have a rather large system here. And that's, that's now the key point. Um, even if you have already split kernel and, and root FS, if, if a single file changes in the, in the root FS, you may have to replace everything. Also something technically, it's a technical reason for that, boot um, the, the, the kernel um, container, the UPI, has a logical uh, correlation with the root FS because it, for example, for the DM Verity, it has to contain the root hash for the root FS. So if you're, if you're updating your, uh, your kernel, uh, sorry, if you're updating your root FS by just replacing a file, you get a different root hash. And because you get a different root hash, you have to redistribute an updated UKI image. So you can see already a single change can, can uh, impact um, the whole chain significantly. And there comes the question of, um, yeah, why not use uh, or apply Delta updates? It's also an old feature of SW update, and the concept is even much older. Um, so compared to the classic way of doing the complete image build and, and the complete image uh, deployment or artifact deployment every time you do an update, um, we only want to really distribute the delta between the current version and the new version. So what has to be done for that? Um, that is the key question. Um, because in the end, you have to generate, first of all, these delta um, from your build process, in addition to the full image that you may still generate. Um, and you have to decide on how to distribute the delta and how to apply it there. So these are the key questions. Um, is it possible to do that? Technically, um, people were talking about it, but how to implement it actually? Can we keep up the security along that? So if we change this property, is the, the, the signing procedure we have still applicable? And also, how do we have to change the build process of our images to make that as smoothly as possible generatable? Uh, if you have to adjust the build process for every other update because something is slightly different, this will not be used in practice. So with these questions, I would hand over to Felix because I think he has the answers. Let's see. So when you start investigating about how to just update the delta you have, uh, you will see there are a couple of options with all their pros and cons. And um, there's also a great talk by Stefano Babic, that's uh, the uh, developer or maintainer of the SW Update project, 
about uh, which options we have there, which are suitable for SW update, which are not so well suited. And the most promising ones are the ones I show here. So in, in, in short, um, an interesting project is the Z-Chunk or Z-Chunk project, which is at first just a compression format. But the interesting thing hereby is that it compresses in a way so that you can generate a header with all the checksums of the blocks or like big, bigger blocks then. Um, and then there is a tool which just takes a checksum file, compares it to an existing file, and then just downloads the delta, basically the checksums that are not yet, not yet there. Um, the uh, project has another advantage that you don't need to compress. That means you can also do that on already compressed files and by that avoid some issues you have, like recompression is almost always a bad thing and so on. Uh, another project is the Ardiff library or Ardiff uh, tool which uses the librsync uh, library which can be used to generate um, a delta file which then can be shipped out of band. That means you can based on two files, just generate a third one which contains the delta between both and then when you have the original file and the delta, you can generate the, the new one and you just need to ship this small delta file and it doesn't matter how you ship it. Like you can put it on a web server or you can also put it in your SW update artifact um, or you can transport it by any other mechanism. Finally, a project that was mentioned a couple times also here at the conference is the CA sync project. Um, this is a, a combination of the rsync algorithm with an content addressable storage. But unfortunately, that's not very well suited for the embedded use case because um, firstly, you cannot simply distribute an update artifact as the, uh, this content addressable storage is a huge set of files and a directory structure and so on, which you need to put somewhere. And uh, second, the download itself uses many, many re requests. And if you need to do HTTP requests, especially via HTTPS on an embedded device, it can be quite costly, costly in terms of the compute power that ne you need. And also by that, um, the time the update takes to, to be performed. Let's first have a look at the Ardiff handler for SW update, which uses the uh, librsync um, mechanisms. Why do we start with that? Because it's the most simple pattern you can do as you basically don't need to change anything. The first step hereby is to build the image. Like always, in the, both with Yocto as well as with ISA, which we use in the CIP project, um, you have a build pipeline and in the end, you get a couple of artifacts out of that build pipeline. One is a WIC file, which is just an image you can flash onto a SD card or a disk and then boot from that. Important for the first deployment, but after that not so important anymore because you want to do updates and not whole reflashing. Uh, second, you get out an SWU file, which is exactly this update artifact, which you then transfer to the device. So this will be our starting point also for comparing the next, or having a look at the next algorithms here. So that's this SWU uh, file here. Um, to generate the delta file now, you need a signature of the old image, so an RDF signature, because as said, you will pre-generate a delta file and by that you need to know against which to generate this delta file. So here first you generate it and um, uh, then the, you create um, a new SWU file uh, which contains of course the metadata as well as the delta file there. Then the next step hereby is to upload that file to an update server. I'm not sure if everyone is familiar with the pattern SW update uses but usually it's that we have a backend and a frontend and the backend here is a server or it can be a um, management system where you do the device management and um, then you have the device and the device pulls the server if there are updates or not. So here first you need to upload the new uh, SWU file which only contains the delta part uh, to the server and this file is quite small as of course it only contains the delta. And the third step hereby is to download that file to the device. 
So usually the device just pulls uh, in regular intervals or you have maintenance windows and then during that maintenance in, uh, window, SW update, pulls the server and if there's a new one, then it starts to apply that image. It downloads the image and then applies the image. There's one important detail to mention here. Um, now we need to combine the old image and the Delta file to finally generate the new image. That is a bit different like how you would do it with a regular rsync. And the reason for that is that you have two partitions. Like you have the currently running partition and you have the partition you want to update which you then boot into in the next reboot. And you need to create the new image on the currently non-active partition based on the old image with, which is in the currently running partition, so that needs to be read only, uh, together with the delta. And that also brings us to, or directly brings us to the advantages and disadvantages. The good thing hereby is you can apply that pattern to the already existing infrastructure you have. Like the update server doesn't care if this is a delta file or not because it only gets the SWU file and needs to ship that or provide that. But there is no additional files needed. Uh, also, as Jan mentioned before, we support signing these SWU files. And the reason for that is to make sure that only a trusted provider can actually provide an update file for a device. And here we can directly do the same signing as with the full update file um, by just doing at the, the signing at the build time, which is very good because then we don't ne need to hand out any cryptographic material to, to a third party who runs the update server. Uh, also, you could do um, an offline update via U a USB drive, um, like with a rescue stick, for instance, um, and by that support use cases where you don't have network connectivity. That might not be the default use case, but it's supported by that pattern. And finally, when talking about the update sizes, the RDF algorithm has the disadvantage that it only works well if the image is big and the delta is small. But these are just qualitative measures. How do you know how big your update will be? And here, in this case, you can simply compare the full image update, so the, the SWU file here, with the delta update file and see which one is bigger. And if your delta, for whatever reason, is bigger than the original one, well, then you just don't do a delta update. Then you just ship the full image update instead of, of the delta. But a major drawback hereby is that you need to know what is running on your device as this needs to match the, the delta image you generated. So you can not do um, image skipping updates, uh, but only can do incremental updates. A slightly different uh, version of the same pattern here is uh, the RDF handler with an on-demand generated image. That means we have the same workflow, but if you look here at what we do at the build system and what we do at the update server, we do the generation of the delta image at the update server. So hereby the device just tells the update server what checksums or what kind of image is currently running there. Um, then this, inform this, this RDIF signature is uploaded to the uh, update server and the update server generates a new matching uh, delta update SWU file based on what the device has. This sounds like a good idea, but in practice, it's not really applicable. And the reason for that is that while you're able to support different versions of the, uh, the things that are running on the device, you need to generate the update file on the update server, which is usually not under your control, or at least not under the control of the vendor, like us, uh, but is running at the customer side. And as we also want to sign these updates, now we need to hand out crypt cryptographic material to our customer, which runs the server. And this, in practice, is often not possible. Uh, also, the uh, pass on the left, which is in this dotted box here, is not supported by the SW update uh, API itself. So you need to do that somehow out of band. Um, so in, in practice, this sounds good, but often it's not, not, not really working. But anyways, I wanted to show it um, just to, to highlight how flexible these approaches are. 
The third approach hereby is using the uh, Z-chunk handler. I showed it before, which uses a totally different um, strategy while still using um, SW update to perform the update. So first, at the build system, you again start with the SWU file with the new image or the full image. And then you generate a new SWU file by removing the original image and replacing it with the Z-chunk image header, which is just a file that contains the block checksums of the image. And of course, this file is really, really small, like it's a megabyte or less. Uh, and that's on the only thing you, you need to put into that SWU file. Then you upload two artifacts to the update server. One is the SWU file that also will be downloaded later on by SW update, which is small because it only contains the checksums, as well as the full image. And hereby I mean the full root of S. And finally, um, the SW update, which is running at the target, then downloads the SWU file here from the, uh, from the update server, pretty standard, like always. And then via a handler, um, triggers a download of just the chunks which we don't have on the device yet. These chunks are then up, uh, downloaded from the HTTP server here. And you might think that if I download chunk by chunk, that's quite inefficient. Yes, that's true. But there's an optimization, and this makes quite a big difference. So this download here uses HTTP range requests. That means we can download whole ranges of chunks, even non-continuous ranges of chunks, in a single HTTP request. That also means if we do HTTPS, we only need to set up the, the uh, or do the handshake once and can download um, all the chunks no matter where they are in the image. That's a, it's a quite a big advantage. Now you might ask which HTTP server support that HTTP range request feature. And the good thing is basically all, even the Go built-in uh, server supports that. And the reason is that all the big video platforms like YouTube, they use that. So it's a pretty commonly used feature which we, which we uh, rely on here. And then also this handler combines the old image uh, with the delta chunks we just downloaded and writes that to the new partition here. The advantage hereby is that it's very flexible because you don't need to know which image you are running on the device. Um, also, it's supported in SW update, no special API needed. And regarding the update size, you don't need to have a look at if the update is small or big because as only the chunks are downloaded, the update can't get any bigger than the original file, which is a huge advantage if you really don't know from where to where you are uh, updating. Uh, but the disadvantage is you need to upload two images to the update server, so your update server needs to actually support that. And um, second, this pass here, the delta downloader currently is HTTP only, specified by the Z-chunk standard, or Z-chunk implementation. Um, and that means you need to have somehow an HTTP pass between these two entities, which is not always possible in, in all uh, use cases we, we have. Now, a very important thing to mention when talking about uh, these updates. The most important thing when talking about Delta updates is to make your update as small as possible, because if you can generate a, a huge set of, of Delta there, the advantage to do the Delta update is minimal. So one important thing here is to build things reproducible. As I said, both with ESA as, as well as with Yocto, you build everything uh, freshly. And here you need to make sure you build reproducible, as otherwise you will have Delta in things which you didn't touch, actually, just because they can't be built reproducibly. So here, it's, let's consider that the, the red package is the one uh, where we have our real delta because we changed something, but then all other packages should stay the, th the same. The next thing is that you don't ship packages, but you ship a rootfs. That means first you need to install all these packages into a rootfs. And you might be surprised, but installing reproduci reproducibly is a totally different story, especially when talking about Debian, where you have post installs scripts, things might run in a different order. So um, you really need to put some thought 
into how to install reproducible so that also this delta is small. We at the civil infrastructure uh, platform, we uh, implemented some patterns there which help the user, like also fixing the uh, files, file timestamps so that you don't have uh, changes in all the files just because the timestamps of each and every file changed. Then, for our read-only rootfs, we use a squashfs. This can also be in a DM Verity container, but the rootfs itself is a squashfs, and this is compressed to make it small. But there is a thing compression algorithms are good at, and that is reading the whole, the whole information they get to then generate the best possible compressed artifact from that. That doesn't help us here, because if we change a little bit in the input, likely everything in the output changes, so our data delta will be huge again. So what most uh, compression algorithms support here is a so-called rsync mode or rsyncable flag, um, which performs state resets. That means only a, a bigger chunk is compressed, and then the next chunk is compressed, but the information from the previous chunk is not, not, not used to better compress the next chunk, and by that you also limit the chunks that actually changed. And the final thing is, you will generate an update artifact, which usually is compressed again. So here, make sure that you don't compress that, otherwise you have exactly the same problem as before, and double compression usually doesn't make any sense anyways, as it doesn't make the artifact smaller, it just changes the, the entropy in the artifact, which we want to keep as low as possible. So let's have a look at what is already implemented and um, what, what can be used as of, as of today. So first of all, the required component um, are all packaged in either zip core, and, and you can use that. And then we have support for both the artif algorithm as well as the uh, Z-chunk algorithm to generate these artifacts. Unfortunately, it's currently on the mailing list. There's a branch. I put it uh, in the, the caption here. Um, it's not re yet released because in CIP, if we add a feature, we also want to keep that stable, so we want to do it right. So that that's why it's still under review, but uh, if you are interested, just use that branch and play around with it. Otherwise, in the next week or two weeks, it, it will be integrated anyways. From an SW update perspective, everything we need is there. The project itself supports it, the update handler supports it, and we have support for chaining handlers. Why do we need to chain handler? Because the first thing you need to do is to check where to apply the update, like to which partition, and the second, Thing you need to do is how to apply the update, like with the delta handler. And when looking at the uh, commonly used backends, for RDIF there is no change required because you still have only this one SWU file. For that chunk, you need a backend that supports it. With a Hawkbit backend, that's not the case yet, but you still can make it work on that backend by just shipping the uh, Z chunk artifact, so not the SWU file, but the artifact uh, from a different URL. And it doesn't need to be on the same server. You can also put it on a CDN or wherever. With the uh, WFX backend, everything is supported out of the box. And we also tried that, so it's actually working. Um, let's come to a frequently asking, asked question. How about Delta updates and security? So the building part is clear. Not so much changed here. Uh, anyways, we just look at the set chunk part as um, with the RDIF part, the Workflow is pretty similar to doing a full image update, but Zchunk is a bit special. So the first thing here is that in this new SWU file, you have, um, of course, the SW description file, and this file assigned, so you can check a signature. You can both do that at the update server as well as when downloading the artifact at the target. Second, if you you now need to have an HTTP pass between here and so between the update server and the, um, the device. And of course, everything is secured there, but you might have more complicated um, login patterns here, which are not supported by SW update, which you also then need to do via this handler here, which is a very minimal piece of software. So it's tricky to implement there. But you can work around it by just using a local proxy which is running on the uh, image, uh, on the uh, target, which does the, uh, which acts as a reverse proxy and does all the complicated cryptographic stuff like HTTPS, um, the login into the backend and things like that. So, no problem. Finally, 
you now have two artifacts. One is the SWU file and one is the, the Delta file, which you then download from the, uh, this, this file here, which you then download from the update um, server. And now you could exchange or replace this file here as it's not signed. But this is also not a problem as this is protected by the checksums you have in here. So basically when we, we know which, check, which uh, chunks to download and then we download a chunk and see that the checksum does not match maybe between this one here and the, the thing from the, uh, the checksum headers here, uh, then we know that something incorrect is going on there and we can stop the update. So also that is perfectly safe and secure. And finally, the new image is, uh, as I said, if you do a secure boot, you also want to make sure that the rootfs cannot be replaced. So you do a, usually do a DM Verity container around that. But as we recreate exactly the same image as in the beginning, just the way we recreate it is different, but it's bitwise identical. Also the DM Verity hash uh, still matches. Um, next topic is Delta updates and secure boot. Why does it work? If you think about it, it's rather easy to understand why it works. So the workflow or the, the boot flow is exactly the same as Jan presented before. So first we have the, the bootloader, which is in our case EFI bootguard. It's just an EFI binary which is signed with the secure boot keys. This then selects based on a configuration file the next partition to boot from where the UKI, so the unified kernel image is. And also this is an EFI file. So we also sign it just with the secure boot keys. When we now do an update, Currently, we only partially update or delta update the rootfs, which is the big thing, uh, but we fully update the kernel. This is also an important thing. We, we could also update the, the kernel um, with a delta algorithm. Currently, we don't do it because the kernel is rather small anyways. So there's not a big benefit of doing so. Um, and this kernel here in the initRD has the DM Verity hash. So we then for, uh, check the DM Verity hash um, for the, the rootfs that should be, should be uh, used next and mounted next, and only if that matches, then we mount that. But as said before, the DM Verity container is bit by bit identical from the original image, like if we would do a full update, so that also works. And finally, we have a data partition, um, which is usually DM crypt, uh, encrypted so that uh, no one can read the data um, that is generated uh, while the system is, is running, and that just uses the uh, hardware or firmware TPM to, to do the key handling and then uh, decrypt that stuff. So let's summarize things. I guess time is almost over anyways. Um, using Delta updates is more resource efficient and it's much, or you get a bit bigger benefit if the image is big and the changes are small. But with the Z chunk handler, you also benefit if the delta is not too small. It's always better than just doing a full update. And um, it's still reliable, so we still support this dual copy update pattern. Uh, you don't have any impact on the security, as I showed. But unfortunately, it's also not a free lunch. Like, you need to make sure what are the pros and cons of each algorithm. Like, for the RDF algorithm, the advantage is that you can pre-generate everything, you can transmit the SWU file out of, out of band, um, no need to have a direct connection to the update server. While for the Z chunk, the update pattern is easier as you don't need to pre-generate things, but you need a way to communicate via HTTP between the update server and the, um, the target. Then I want to give a huge shout out to um, the Toshiba colleagues uh, who did most of the implementation there in uh, CIP as well as to my Chinese colleague Wang Chi who tested really throughout all the patterns we have there and um, we iterated quite a time with the Toshiba colleagues to finally get a thing that is both robot, robust as well as easy to use. And by that we are done and I hope we have some time for questions. We have a microphone. Yeah, wait. Do we have a microphone? I think, yeah. Because Mike? we have a remote audience as well and then <laughs> it's easier for them. Thank you. Let's turn it on. <laughs> oh, yeah. Otherwise you can also yeah. ask the question we just repeat. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you.
Hello. Hi, thank you for your presentation. Um, a little bit related to this topic, maybe that's why I think you did not mention is um, resume or start over of download, downloading the chunks, uh, mm -hmm. if we want to call it chunks. Um, do those technologies support that? So if you are downloading a chunk or part of it and, I don't know, you lose internet connection, then can you resume downloading from where you stop it later? Thank you. Do you want to answer, Jan? Okay, so it depends on the algorithm. For SW Update itself, there is support to resume the uh, update as far as I know. But for the Z-Chunk handler, if I remember correctly, it's not yet implemented. In theory, you can also think about up optimizing the whole pattern a bit. Like, as I said, we need to recreate the whole image on the, uh, on the new partition. So we write always, when we do an update, we still write the whole new partition. But what we could do is read first what's in there, and only if there's a diff, then we just up, uh, download that part and um, make a change there. Uh, as far as I know, it's not implemented yet. So that would be our, our next step to do. Other questions? Okay. Seems not to be the case then. Thanks for having us Thank you. and enjoy the conference.